What is going on, everybody? I am Mike Samich for RacingDudes.com, and today I'm joined by Mr. Aaron Halterman, and we're going to take a look at some derby trips. Aaron, who are you excited to take a look at today? Yeah, I mean, a lot of them, right? I, how did Epicenter lose? How did Zandon lose? I think those are two things we'll kind of analyze. Uh, did they have an excuse? And then, of course, with this, maybe trips weren't the worst thing, but just the pace. And so we're going to yeah. take a look at, at the pace and just how crazy it was as well. So uh, you know, and I guess you have to be most excited about the winner, right? How did Rich Strike do this? Yeah, I agree. I think that's a great place to start. So we're going to jump right into Rich Strike first, and then we're going to cover Epicenter, Zandon, and Modonigal on this video. Don't forget to check out the two part of this video. We're going to also cover Messier, Teba, Zozos, and White Abario. All right, so the first horse that we're going to take a look at here is Rich Strike, who breaks all the way out from the 21 post. And Aaron, the first thing I notice is Son of Leon just says, hey, find me the rail, right? It doesn't break that well, but goes immediately into the rail to save some ground. Yeah, he mimics Calvin Burrell and what he used to do with horses that were drawn out wide in the Kentucky Derby. Just take them back and get to the rail. He broke to the right for a split second, and then quickly they corrected him. And I mean, if you've watched all of his races up to this point, you're not surprised where he's at at, the, at this moment. No, not at all. And, and I'm actually like, when you look at this trip, you see he's traveling here with Mo Donegal all the way in the back. They're currently sitting in 17th and 18th position. Mo Donegal actually saves some ground, sits on the rail. It'll be interesting to keep that in mind when we go into the second turn, where that's kind of flip-flopped. It makes a big difference in this race. It's a head scratcher, right? One draws the rail, one draws the 21, and one saves all the ground in the final turn. And one is, well, I don't know how many wide they're going to end up being. We'll say we'll see it here in a minute, but at least like six or seven wide. Incredible. And you can see that uh, right here, Rich Strike starting to make up a little bit of ground. You're going to see him in the red cap back here. I'm trying to get the cursor on him so you can take a good look at his trip. And Son Leon makes a couple decisions here. You see they went the 45, point, 45 and 2 for that first opening half. And you'll kind of see that when he starts to make his move, he weeds in and out of horses. But then, like you mentioned, he decides to save ground versus Modano, who goes five or six wide. And that makes the, the difference you're heading into the stretch. It's very interesting. If you go back and watch his races at Turfway, he did the exact same thing. It literally is the same ride. The difference was he actually got in trouble in the John Battaglia. If you go back and watch that, he got that horse in all kinds of trouble, but he doesn't leave the inside with this horse uh, in those last two prep races. And so he's doing the same thing here. Hey, you know, Mike, you watch races just as much as I do. 99 times out of 100, you're going to get this horse stopped at some point, but boom, it opens right up for him. Oh, you nailed it. I mean, you're, you're rolling the dice because if you get stopped, you you're done, right? And here you see he moves just outside of Messier, who's, who's tiring pretty badly here, and then comes home. Like, the race isn't that fast. I don't think either of us thinks Rich Strike is this amazing horse, but comes home sub-25. Haven't seen that done in a long time, so you got to really love his final furlong here. Yeah, it was fantastic. And like I said, when Messier backs up like that, many times if you're on the rail sitting behind the speed horse in the derby that's backing up, you're screwed. If you've got any kind of horse at all, you're not going to be able to get through. There's a wall of horses. It parted like the Red Sea. I mean, it, he just had all the all the opportunity in the world there. Now, of course, then the horse has to go out and, and finish it up. The horse could have passed Messe and hung for third or fourth, but no, he kept on flying. But that decision to stay inside where Mo Donegal and Barber Road, yes, Barber Road, were floated way out there. <laughs> if, if they change trips, you never know. One of those other horses may have won this race. So the decision to stay inside ultimately led to this horse getting up for the win. It's pretty incredible, too, because in a race of 20 horses, it's funny to see how they decide to go 8, 9, 10, 11 wide, and the one jockey who does it makes a difference. And so maybe in the future you can almost say, hey, I know they're going to fan wide. Maybe I can try and save a little ground here if the jockeys watch this back and try and pick up whatever they can from this race. I mean, you know, I have to look at it after this, right? If he can win it on an 80 to one, 80 to one shot, uh, you, you know, surely you could do it on a Modonigal type horse, right? <laughs> Definitely, definitely. All right, let's uh, let's jump forward now. We're going to watch this replay again. This time we're going to focus on the three epicenters. So we're going to talk a little about his trip and the ride that Joel Rosario gives epicenter. And uh, first thing that I noticed, right, when you we'll watch him break out here, gets him out clean. But this is the furthest off the pace epicenter's ever been. I thought Joel did a great job. And often I criticize him for taking horses too far back. I thought he did a great job really like having that clock in his head be correct and not get epicenter too close to this pace early. It was kind of brilliant when you think about it because Epicenter certainly, certainly without any doubt is a candidate to be up here on this wild pace. Uh, you know, we kind of thought he would be next to a Messier type and Messier sitting there in third behind those two wild speed horses. But no, he pulled it back. Steve Asmussen after the race said, hey, first time they ran by us, I was pissed. And he said, then I yeah. see the fractions like, wow, he's doing exactly what he should be doing. 
it, it, it was a wonderful ride. You can see him. He's too off the rail here. He had the rail for the most of that first turn. Um, and he was literally the leader in that first pack, right up on Charge It right now on the inside of Charge It. Gets a, a beautiful ride from Zario, able to save ground on both turns. One question people have been, or one thing people have been saying is he went a little bit too early and that cost him the race. Do you think he kind of made this move into the second turn too early or do you think this was perfectly timed? Monday morning, Monday morning quarterbacking uh, for the jockeys when, when the horse doesn't win the race is the easiest thing in the world to do. <laughs> I was watching this race live and I said he just won the race. I thought it was a brilliant move. You, you have to get that position. We've talked about that for months about this race. You have to get that position. Look at him, he's saving all the ground. He's moving up, he's getting in position. He's not asking him for everything. And then boom, when he gets to this turn, he's right there with a shot. I thought it was a, a heady move to do this. I thought I thought it was perfect. And he, he just had a perfect ride that <laughs> ultimately didn't get rewarded. I 100% agree. I mean, we talk about how important it is to be in the lead late in this race and in, in the top of the stretch phase or being at that quarter pole and being in the lead. And he did everything right to set his horse up to be in the right spot at the top of the lane to be clear, be loose and get in front. Um, you have Zandon who's trying to run him down. We're actually going to talk about Zandon in the next trip. But he does everything right but win. And I, I, you got to feel for Joel Rosario. You got to feel for Steve Asherson. Excited to see what he can do in the Preakness and what kind of price you get on him as well. And my thing is, if he moved too early and that horse truly was gassed, Zandon would have got by him. And so I, I think, look at him. He's pulling away from Zandon. He was not, it's not like he was a tired horse. I think the 21 Red Strike sneaks up, sort of like Call Me Midnight did to this horse in the Lacan snuck up on him and what by the time he saw him he's like oh shit it's over and i just lost you know but you saw that horse dig in on zandon because about mid-stretch you and i looked at each other and said i think zandon's gonna win this thing yeah i, I thought zandon was gonna have it around the turn but it, i i love the point that you brought up there where he didn't uh, when when you saw rich strike on the inside go by him he actually pulled away from zandon and responded with rich strike Maybe he hit the front too early. Maybe Epicenter doesn't want to be in the lead, but he went wire to wire before. So it's hard to really believe that that's a factor either. I think this is just the case of uh, you know a little bit better horse or horse got a better trip, ended up getting getting him beat. But here, if you look, it looks like Zan's going by. And as soon as you see the 21 on the inside, yep. Epicenter again re-engages. And so uh, it's a tough beat for Epicenter, tough beat for Ashton and, and tough beat for Rosario. It's almost like he, when he gets into a battle, he locks into a horse and he keeps that horse at bay. But then you, you know, you can sneak up on him because he and he won't see it coming. But like I said, he, with Papa Cap, you go back and watch the comp. He, he did the same thing. He kind of locked in on him. He put him away. He kind of was, you know, I don't know what you could never know what a horse was thinking. But it looked like to me in his head, he was thinking, all right, I got him. And then here comes Call Me Midnight. This uh, that time on the on the far outside to, to catch him late. So that's uh, that's a look at Epicenter's trip. Let's fast forward or rewind, I guess, here. Go back and look at uh, Zanin coming out of the 10 post here with Flavian Pratt. This horse is a little different than the, than the previous horse we looked at with Epicenter. He wants to come from further off the pace. So he's going to sit late in the, the pack here. But again, breaks pretty clean. We both like the 10 post for him. And I thought Pratt did a great job of kind of saving ground. He's jostled, jostled a little bit there by Charge It. But going into this first turn, he's kind of where you expect him to be, sitting in, you know, 12th or 13th place. And this is another ride that's getting criticized, and it's just like, what what could you have wanted for this horse? We talked all week, please don't have him in 19th or 20th. Get him in yep. 10th, 11th, 12th, get him in that mid-pack. He's perfect. He broke from the 10. He's going to save all the ground, I mean, that you possibly could here. You're going to see him weave in and out of traffic. I mean, he followed Epicenter. He saw he just followed Epicenter's move. He's tracking Epicenter. He's thinking, okay, as soon as he moves, I'm gonna move and we'll just see who the best horse is. I thought it was a flawless ride. I really, really did. What's amazing too is you mentioned how we expected, you know, please don't be later in the pack. Please try and be in that 10th spot somewhere around there. Yeah. He was in that spot when they went 2145. I mean, so he ran significantly faster to even just be in that spot. I thought Pratt did a great job of getting the horse engaged making sure that he wasn't too far back early, which also allowed him to follow up a center. As you mentioned, he was able to save some ground and then follow up a center versus when we're going to look at Mo Donegal next, he's got to go a million wide to try and get around these horses who are coming back into him. Yeah, I mean, look at these two horses here. You see the epicenter and then, Zan like I said, Zandon's just tracking. They're both on the rail. They're both going to just have to tip out. I mean, they were masterful rides. And, and this Flavian Pratt is, by the time this year is over, after he's uh, ridden up in New York for, for the whole season for Belmont Saratoga, people are just going to be going insane. They don't, they don't realize how good this guy is. But look at this. He's tracking yeah. perfect. He saved all the ground on the turn. Here he comes out, and it's just you've got the whole stretch to gain on him. And, it, I mean, it certainly felt like, especially right here, yep. oh, wow, Zandon's going to win this thing. And what, we're all going to be talking about this trip. 
And of course, yeah, Rich Strike gets up and beats them both. It was absolutely amazing that Rich Strike, Strike gets by on the inside. And I, I'm surprised still that Zanin didn't get by on the outside. I thought Pratt gave him a beautiful ride, like you said. He he wheeled out later than Rosario did. He saved those extra 10, 15, 20 feet of space by, by waiting a little bit longer. But as someone, like as a horse that closes well, you really expected Zanin, if he was that close and got that good of a trip, that he would get by. Uh, you're worried at all that Zanin hangs. I mean, because we talked about, you know, he doesn't win a lot of races. He got up, obviously, in, in, at Keeneland. But that was his first win, like first win in a stakes race. Yeah. Oh, you have any fear that Zan is a little bit of a hanger? Or you think it was Epicenter battling back? Uh, that's good. that's a question for for handicapping in the future for sure. I wouldn't play it against Epicenter because I think he had to beat him in that spot. To be completely honest, but you look at it. Okay, he kicked clear of a lot of other horses in this race. Um, so, boy. If, if you bet him, I think you're saying, yeah, he is a hanger. He's an SOB. Because <laughs> um, you kind of thought at mid-stretch he was going to do what Rich Strike did there and beat Epicenter yep. by maybe a half or a quarter or three quarters. Um, you know, his only win uh, in a stakes was against Smile Happy. Um, I, I don't, I'm not that high on anymore. So I don't know. That's, that's for another day, I guess. But he definitely hung in this stretch. I don't think you can argue. We'll see him coming back in the Belmont episode and now pointing to the Preakness. So I, I bet the next time we see these two together, maybe in the Travers or maybe in the Haskell, it will probably be somewhere on the East Coast. I think this would be a fun Travers if we get to get these two two to bang heads together together. Oh, it'd be awesome. Yeah, I, I, I definitely. And, you know, the, the winner, whether you like him or not, any race he's in for the rest of his life will create buzz and interest as well. So, yeah, I mean, this has got a chance to be a really fun setup this year. I talk about another horse that's going to be uh, in those races on the <laughs> East Coast. I assume let's let's go back and take a, let's go back and take a peek here at Modana, who's coming out of the one post, and, and we bashed the one post pretty good here. I didn't think the break was that bad here for for Modana. I thought he got out pretty clean, and and he wants to be all the way in the back. He bumps the gate a little bit, but he wanted to be in the back anyway. I thought this is pretty much where you want to be placed, right? He got out clean, but he's just slow, and that's okay because, <laughs> like I said, he. He has no excuse, right, uh, here for the start. He was right next to the winner. They were flying. This was his chance. It set up absolutely perfect for him. Even though he got pushed way back, it didn't matter. It was actually where he wanted to be. That's what I thought was amazing, too. I mean, if you tell me they go 21 and change, 45 and change, you got to say, okay, Zandon or Modana go won the race, right? I mean, coming into it? Absolutely. Absolutely. I would not have been surprised at all. When they, when they put up that opening quarter, I was just like, oh my gosh, <laughs> please, Barbara yeah. Road, don't win. Because I'll, yeah. ne I'll never hear about, the, uh, hear about that again. But yeah, but Mo Donegal, it's like, it's perfect. And we talked, like you said, we talked the whole you know month leading up to this. Zan and Mo Donegal, two closers that are really, really good. You know, they could just get the trip or the setup. They got the setup. I don't know if Modano will get the trip. I guess we'll talk about it in a second. Yeah, I think that's really what we focus on, right? We, we talked about the 21 Rich Strike to start the video out and how he went inside. The key here is to watch where Modano went. I yeah. love that he's in the lime green silks uh, right up here. So he's pretty easy to follow here from the one post. And Irad makes a decision. I don't want to get stopped. I want to swing wide. I think he expected him to come back a little bit more than they, they necessarily did. And he thought he might be able to run him down. So here you saw the 21 went a little bit earlier. So Rich Strike goes inside and goes a little earlier. Now you start to see Modonigal make his move, but he's going to have to swing outside of all of these tiring horses and just go wider and wider. And you can follow those lime green silks. That's Barber Road right next to him. He's literally, they're the two widest horses on the track here. They're outside of White of Barrio. That's like 12 wide. <laughs> It, it, and they lost all the momentum. And like I said, the horse that he's sitting inside of for most of the race, here he comes weaving in on the inside as Modona goes way out there. And, you know, you could just see the difference in, in saving ground versus not for a horse that's, that's closing. You know, Modona, he's, he's trying, but he's just, he's worn out. So do you want Modona go back in the future? Or do you, is this a horse where you're, you're all about how the race sets up now for him? He's one that's going to win probably once this year and kill you. You know what I mean by that? Like, yep. no, I don't really. Well, it depends, right? Like, it depends on the, the quality of the field. You know, if we get to the Travers and all these horses are gone, something's happened, they skipped it, then sure, he's got a shot. He's an honest horse. I think you can really count on him to bring the same thing every time. But to beat the top-level horses, meaning these horses that came out of this, the top three, let's just throw Rich Strike in there as well, top three finishers, he needs a setup. 
without any doubt. And this was his, if he couldn't win this Kentucky Derby, I don't know what to say. I mean, you, you have to be incredibly disappointed that he didn't get the job done with this setup. I would agree that that you got to be a little bummed here. I will give him a little bit of a pass in this spot because of how wide he went. Um, he's almost built for a smaller field that has pace versus a big field like this that has pace because he, he's going to be coming from the back. And, and I read made the decision to go wide versus Sonny making the decision to go inside, which probably made a pretty big difference here. I mean, we're talking about six lengths at the end of it, and he was 12 wide. So it could have made made that six length difference if he was able to get the trip that Rich Strike got. So I, I'm interested in him coming back. But I, I like you need the right setup, you need the right field size because he is going to get in trip trouble consistently because he's coming from so far back. Well, that's the big thing. He's he's always probably going to swing wide. Um, he's not as agile as the winner, right? Like we haven't ever really been able to see him weave in and out of traffic, things like that. So that's the key. Uh, shorter field, you might be right. It, we're, we're almost a situation where he sits a little closer just because the paces are usually a little bit easier in shorter fields and then he can just kind of swoop up and get them having to go three or four wide instead of 12. He's he's going to win one of these races this year. That's my prediction. I'm not quite sure yet where, but he, a Haskell, a Travers, a Jib Dandy, his name's on one of that. Pennsylvania Derby, something like that. Yep. Uh, yeah. Who's in the field? Pace dynamics. That's that's always going to be the key for him. Well, thank you very much for joining me, Aaron, to check out these first four contenders here in the Kentucky Derby, four of the top five finishers, really, in Rich Strike, Epicenter, Zandon, and Modongo. Make sure you check out the second part of this video. We're going to talk about Messier, Teba, Zozos, and Way to Barrio, how their trips were in the Derby, and whether or not we want to bet them back. Make sure you like and subscribe to the video and the channel. Check out more videos like this. We'll have a ton of content coming out leading up to the Preakness, leading up to the Belmont, and then on to New York for, for, uh, for Saratoga's Meet, as well as Del Mar out in California. Thank you very much for checking us out. This has been a presentation of RacingDudes.com, your destination for all things horse racing and sports betting. Whether you want free winners, expert insider picks, up-to-the-minute trackside weather reports, or podcasts and videos for bettors of all skill levels, never make another wager without visiting the Racing Dudes first.